we'll now be starting with the final session of the day at the bar. And uh, this might be the final session, but this is the one which I have been personally eagerly waiting for. From idea to scale, perspective from India's leading early stage impact entrepreneurs. After all, what is impact investing without its entrepreneurs? The people who are running innovative impact enterprises to solve India's development challenges, all the while operating sustainable business models. This particular panel will be moderated by Mr. Ramesh Venkar, co-founder of Bakery Ventures, an online marketplace for socially motivated entrepreneurs and investors. The panelists for the session include Mr. Vipul Sharma, co-founder and CEO of Jetco, India's first new bank for small business owners. Mr. Manil Kovit, co-founder and CEO of Lal10, an e-commerce portal for artisans. Mr. Amit Dakiyan, co-founder and CEO of Tusker Transport, a last mile logistics startup. And Ms. Runa Mehta, CEO of HealthCube, a venture that is democratizing access to health-related diagnosis. Thank you, panelists, for joining us today. And I would now like to hand it over to Naresh to begin the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, this panel is uh, titled From Ideas to Scale. Uh, so where this is coming from is, 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 is one of the major concerns which we have seen in impact investing. Uh, this is maybe in impact investing, we come across uh, very motivated and committed entrepreneurs uh, with, with extremely good backgrounds and track records. We equally come across uh, business models which are, which are fantastic, which, which, which uh, seem to show a lot of promise. But what a lot of investors have a concern about is, is this idea really scalable? Is this, is this business model going to take us somewhere where at the end of three years or five years or 10 years, we're going to have a company of a size which is monetizable, which is exitable and which, which really makes commercial sense. Though, of course, uh, we have an impact uh, agenda. So, so that is what we want to explore here in this, uh, in this discussion. Uh, what we would actually like is, is, is for, for the audience to actually participate and ask some questions. So the way we would like to do this is, uh, uh, give a very brief introduction to the four participants here, to the, to the four entrepreneurs here, and followed by each of them will, will uh, speak for a few minutes on, on their company, on their model, what have they done, and specifically touching on what have they, what have they, what has been their uh, experience in actually trying to attain scale, what are the challenges, how are they overcoming them, and, and what the future may really potential in this matter. And thereafter, uh, hopefully, we will have some questions and answers. Uh, we look forward for some questions from the audience at that point. So, so that's really the agenda. So, so we have Amit from Tusker. Tusker is in logistics, uh, trying to solve the last mile problem. The last mile in logistics, as we know in India, can be quite challenging. It's, it's unreliable. It is, it is quite expensive at times and it's unorganized. And, and Amit has innovative solutions in this area. Uh, we have here uh, Vipul from Checkbook. Uh, which is which is one of India's leading neo banks, uh, catering to small uh, companies, providing them a range of financial services, essentially access to financial services uh, uh, like like banking, insurance, lending, and, and other services. Uh, then we've got Runam from HealthCube, uh, which is in tech-enabled diagnostics. Uh, they have developed a number of innovative products, which uh, combine technology with with uh, diagnostic sciences, making uh, diagnostics affordable as well as accessible to, to, a, to a wide range of people, much more than what conventional diagnostic services have been able to achieve. Uh, they have achieved impressive scale and we'll hear about that shortly. And then we have Mani from Lalten, uh, whose company Lalten works on providing market access to small and medium enterprises, essentially helping them digitize their products, uh, put them on the net and, and actually also helps them to connect with buyers in India and uh, also, uh, in a wide number of, uh, across a whole range of countries, uh, lately Japan. So, so he's opened up a lot of markets to, to, to small companies who struggle to really find uh, buyers for their products, even in India, primarily from a point of view of uh, being or not being able to access them. So, so what we would like to hear from all of them is, is, is their journey so far and uh, how they've actually uh, achieved scale today and, and where they see the future. Uh, so, so we'll, we'll Lack of a better alternative, we go in alphabetical order of the companies. So, checkbook to start with. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, for being here. And I think uh, 
uh, you know, just talk about a little bit about being a first-time entrepreneur. So I am I'm actually a first-time entrepreneur. I used to work in the banking industry. Uh, and I worked at Citibank, HDFC Bank, Invisim Bank, uh, all, all of those sort of three flavors of banks in India um, across almost 20 years. Uh, and then jumped into becoming an entrepreneur. Um, the initial couple of years, you know, were pretty much meandering sort of a phase. Um, you know, we kind of launched ourselves in 2017. And by 2020, we just raised a little bit of ancient funding, about a million dollars. And we just started figuring out what exactly we want to do with the segment and space and so on and so forth. Um, 2020 is when we launched our sort of new bank. Uh, and one of the things we realized is that we wanted to have um, sort of uh, a lot of scale and that we needed, needed uh, a very superior sort of tech product on the on our app. And that's something that we built. So instead of going and saying that we'll sort of launch one product uh, for a segment, we actually said that for this segment of small business owners, which is sort of under 40 lakh turnover, <coughs> sole proprietorships in the country, which are about big number, you know, it's about 63 million, uh, you know, that's the number that's usually said. Um, we're actually going to launch multiple products uh, so that they can actually have access to all financial requirements. So most startups will sort of struggle with launching a single product. But we actually have a full scale sort of current account live on our platform. Uh, we work with ICS Bank, Yes Bank, we work with a couple of other banks as well. And customers can open an account. We just launched a new product which allows customers to open a current account in three minutes. That's the first time in India. Uh, usually it takes a month to open an account, uh, a current account. And it's very similar to what you see with Jupiter Phi who has sort of a savings account proposition for customers, we're able to replicate that uh, in the form of a current account uh, for individuals and sole props, so they can actually start using it. <coughs> we also realize a big reason why customers don't open accounts in traditional banks is because they don't get lending. So why should I put my money in an account and I'm not going to get lending? rather just get lending from a money lender who only have to pay back in cash. You know, usually the rate is 3 to 5% per month. So we actually started lending uh, some time back. Uh, we do it initially started with distribution and then we started expanding to sort of FNDG and so on and so forth. We now do about 30 crores of lending a month. Uh, right? We crossed about 100 crores portfolio some time back. And we essentially do business loans to customers we also do something called Trader BNPL, which is like 14 days of revolving credit uh, on platforms like Metro Cash and Carry, Shop Kirana. Customers can go there, build up a basket, and then pay through checkbook. So all that sort of runs on our, on our own tech platform. We have SDKs over there and so on and so forth. And then recently we started insurance, which we actually got a broking uh, entity. We have an insurance broking entity as a subsidiary of checkbook. And through that, we do both things like insurance on the loans that we give, and then two-wheeler, commercial vehicle, life insurance, and so on and so forth. And that's a revenue line that we start some time back. And very sort of similar to, you know, traditionally banks will need thousands of employees, many years to set up. But we're doing all this, essentially providing full-scale banking services, lending insurance accounts with a 100 member team, right? So I think that's where the technology really plays a role. Uh, the fact that we work with a lot of partners, we work with Geo, Udan, Metro, Shopkid, a bunch of other guys as well, has helped us essentially keep costs really low. But it's been a very, uh, obviously, a, a tough journey like for any entrepreneur. Uh, and, uh, but it's also been a very rewarding journey in the entire process. We've, of course, been revenue generating from day one. We understand that banking, you can make lend revenues only from lending. And that is the reality. Globally, banks, 70% of revenues come from lending. <coughs> so we've embraced that while the traditional sort of VC landscape of POV has been not to do lending and stuff like that. But the Indian consumer needs lending. This segment especially does need formal lending uh, to them. We've been sort of able to build that ecosystem out. Yeah, so I mean, overall, it's been good. We've done about 5x, you know, jump in revenues for the last one year. Got our sort of net worth down by half uh, during the same period. So it's whatever incremental we do essentially brings down costs even more. 
And of course, our lending and insurance is all so profitable, right? So we basically have GNI expenses. So that's been an interesting part of the journey. Um, we have investments from Avishka, a bunch of other guys as well. And yeah, it's been uh, it's been hell of, hell of a ride. We're happy to answer questions around challenges, ecosystem issues, stuff like that as we go along. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me uh, be here, uh, Petri and uh, Prabhav. Uh, it's really exciting uh, and motivating, I think, to see that we are all sector agnostic, but I think we're going to discover we have very similar uh, challenges uh, as we try to scale. So quickly uh, on Health Q, uh, we're solving a very uh, simple problem. Uh, we're solving for access. Uh, most of this country's uh, population doesn't have access to reliable diagnostics. And it's a shame we're 75th year of independence and uh, that's really the problem we're solving. So what we've done is we've created a device uh, which is as small as your setup box. It's one and a half kgs uh, in weight, so it's portable and it does 30 tests uh, on the spot. Uh, I was chatting with uh, some of the participants today and they said, what is the USB? And the USB is very simple. It's reliable. It's clinically validated. We have a CT mark and it gives you the outcome immediately. So let me paint you a little picture to talk about the problem that we solved, right? Uh, imagine you're in Nagaland, right? And, uh, you know, not easy access, rainfalls create, uh, you know, major issues. And a patient walks into a PHC or a private clinic with high fever and chills. It could be dengue, it could be malaria, it could be chicken, it could be a host of things. It's going to take the doctor two to three days to even diagnose this patient. Now, what are my options? I either uh, don't treat him, wait for the test results to come back, or I give him a multitude of treatments. Neither is a viable good option. We sitting in Bangalore or Delhi can't even imagine uh, this happening to us, right? Uh, our device can actually diagnose whether he has malaria, chikungunya, or uh, dengue in 20 minutes. That's one scenario. Now, imagine a similar situation with somebody who comes with uh, heartburn slash heart attack like symptoms. Uh, heart attacks are often confused for heartburn and ignored. Uh, on our device, you can do cardiac markers and a 12 bleed ECG with an interpretation. So a technician does not need to be a doctor. A technician sitting in any PHC in any corner of the country can tell whether this patient needs to quickly be moved uh, into a hospital or simply given antacids. Similarly, there are applications in maternal health care, there are applications uh, you know, in, in different third world countries who are also facing similar problems of reach. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a problem we're solving. Uh, we incorporated in 2016, uh, medical device business is iterative. Uh, this I learned uh, recently as well. It's not something, you know, you don't just make a device and take it to market. You make a device, then you go through huge hurdles of reliability, validity, uh, <coughs> regulatory. And sometimes you realize that your device, while good, is not good enough. So you go back to the drawing board and you re-iterate and re-iterate. So we spent a few years initially getting a product in shape. In 2019, we were ready to go to market. We started selling to doctors. We started seeing some success. But then we all know what happened when COVID hit, uh, private clinics all but shut down and we were forced to pivot. We did a lot of corporate screening camps with the likes of Tech Mahindra. Kind of kept us going, helped the company to survive. We've really taken off only in the last year, year and a half, when we've managed to uh, become more creative with the use cases. Today, we sell to teleconsultation players, hence augmenting uh, the utility of that teleconsultation. We sell to kiosk makers, uh, health ATMs that you're going to see coming up in various places now. We're the technology, we're the heart and soul of that business. We sell to obviously PHCs, we sell to CSR firms, we sell to people who are doing outreach clinics, we can do lab in the back. So we had to get very innovative and really imagine what, what are the ways in which we can solve for access with this device. Another thing that helped was to accept our limitations, right? What are we not? We are not a service company. We, we are not capable of delivering the screening, but we are capable of giving you the device that helps you to do the screening. That's one way of doing it. Uh, we also have to recognize our limitation in what our device does and find ways to expand our technology. So what we've done is we have the ability to integrate other devices within our system. Maternal use case, add a fetal Doppler. 
teleconsultation use case add a digital scope uh, diabetologist kind of a use case add an HbA1c so these are different devices created by other manufacturers but we are able to seamlessly integrate it within our system giving the user a single interface with which they interact and uh, yeah that's where we are and happy to you know answer questions uh, eventually thank you Thank you, Ramesh, for this opportunity. Hi, my name is Manit. My company is called as Lantern, which means lantern in Hindi. Uh, we are here to bring uh, lights in the lives of uh, a lot of micro, small manufacturers who are in the creative space or craft-based manufacturing. I come from a very small town uh, in Gujarat called as Bhavnagar. I am Gujarati and my grandparents uh, were involved into micro manufacturing of leather footwear, something which I am wearing today. So, as a young kid, whenever I was at my native place, thoroughly enjoyed what he was doing, seeing his artisans create products and uh, go to nearby towns and sell people coming to his own shop and make uh, the purchase and all. But later I realized that my grandfather struggled big time financially. He was not able to uh, create a viable business uh, where my father could also join him. So my father became the first engineer. I became the second engineer and the first MBA and life moved on for us. So I did work in consulting, worked in uh, Flipkart for a couple of years and then realized that my calling was what my grandfather was doing. So I tried to convince my parents, obviously it didn't work because my father has first time seen this. And uh, I was convinced that I thoroughly enjoyed what he was doing. My soul was what he was manufacturing. So I took two of my other co-founders uh, who were my batchmates at Flipkart and left the job, didn't tell our parents and moved across the country uh, to meet more than 6,000 manufacturers, just like my grandfather. I think the curiosity at that point in time was to understand, like, is it a specific problem only to Bhavnagar or is it a nationwide problem? And the second thing which was uh, important was that what was the problem? So during our travel, had enough savings uh, from Flipkart um, and uh, we traveled across the country, loved meeting people, eating food and all so that helped us uh, going through this bootstrap journey. But realize that this is huge as a problem. India is, we are all sitting in an urban city right now. Uh, many of us come from urban belts, right? But India is a population of rural uh, cities and rural populations. 70% and more people live in rural India. And uh, after agriculture, creative manufacturing or craft based manufacturing is the largest employment generation sector in our country. So, like, there are more than 1 million people just like my grandfather who do not know where to sell products. They're just dependent on domestic markets to sell products. To put into numbers, India se export kaha se hota? Muradabha, Saranpur, Panipur, Panipat, Erod, Coimbatore, Jaipur maximum, right? Like six places and this contributes to around three and a half billion dollars worth of exports. But why not a Kochampalli or a Chanderi, Maheshwari or a Bhagalpur? or a Varanasi become the next Panipat of our country, right? And why there are people just like my grandfather sitting everywhere, uh, still, still dependent on local markets uh, and trying to sell through exhibition center, it shows a middleman. So it doesn't make sense in this age of uh, tech. Um, I think uh, um, for all the young entrepreneurs, I think Sachin Bini have been the demigods and what they have done at Flipkart is uh, through technology, they have created a revolution. I think that was enough to uh, make sh make this uh, prove that yeah, we can go ahead and try to work and create a tech platform. So at Lalton, uh, we are the Alibaba for Indian craft manufacturers. Uh, we have 2,200 MSMEs across the country. I can probably say that we might be the largest aggregator of craft based producers after even Fab India. And I think uh, the intent when we started this entity in 2016 was that why should Fab India have all the fun in sourcing these products. Let's take it to a west side, WB, Anita, Dongre, whosoever, right? And then until pandemic, we did all of this. But our revenues were not growing much actually. And with pandemic, we realized that uh, there has to be enough to be done. For the sector, the sector wanted to come on a platform because exhi exhibition trade shows all of this uh, traditional ways of doing business. Actually, the entire supply chain collapsed, right? So we created a mobile application which could digitize these MSMEs to create their own web stores on our platform for free. 
uh, with 45,000 products, we are the largest vertical wholesale marketplace from India to the world, catering to these MSMEs. And uh, then the second problem was of designs. A guy sitting in Bhagalpur still creating sarees is not no relevance. So can he create curtains, cushion covers, bed linen, table linen of the same material of a saree in a different color palette, which can appeal to a European or an American buyer or a Japanese buyer makes a lot of sense. So design became the second problem to solve. And the third problem, as he did mention, was is definitely of finance. My grandfather was doing a revenue of couple of crores a year, not a small guy, but still he struggled because he could not invest his savings into building his entity because no one gave him credit for working capital. He was only putting all of his savings into building inventories, right? Doesn't make sense uh, while uh, the banks and NBFCs never looked at the sector because this is, they didn't even ever had a lot of data for all of them. So uh, I think that's what we are trying to build. Uh, we have a very healthy uh, revenue run rate. Uh, today we are almost at around seven and a half crores a month, which we do in revenues. This year, we will be closing at around 70 crores of order <coughs> revenues and 100 crores of order booking, almost 10 times more than what we did last year. We eventually have raised almost around $9 million of equity capital. And uh, being, uh, I think it's a very, uh, I'm very fortunate that uh, some of my investors are also in this room with Suji. Uh, he has uh, been a non impact investor. And I think I would say that it's uh, it becomes very, it gives a lot of confidence to an impact founder when a non-impact investor also invests in a company like ours because I think uh, more than the impact, your impact naturally comes when the revenues and sustainability comes, right? Other than that, Pegasus, they have been our early investors with them also in this room. So I think uh, uh, I think we are a little fortunate and uh, uh, from that sense and uh, we are here for a long haul journey. Uh, we've been very patient in terms of creating a systemic change in this entire sector and uh, uh, yeah, we will be, why not the Alibaba of the Indian MSMEs in the next uh, yeah, few years uh, time frame. So I think that's what we uh, are doing. We are based, a team of 92 people based out of Nomada. A mix from Tesco. Good evening, everybody. So uh, our co company, Tusker, is uh, we are uh, logistics for Bharat, right? So essentially, I think we all have a lot of commonality in terms of uh, trying to solve for the challenges of MSMEs, for small entrepreneurs, or people who are possibly in the unorganized sector, or people who are in a sector of society where they need access to uh, goods and services that maybe aren't uh, fully democratized yet. So I'll tell you just a, a little bit about my personal journey. It's, this is the second company uh, that I've been involved with the founding of. Previously founded a company called Logistimo, which is also in the logistics sector, but it was a supply chain SaaS company, right? So uh, adjacent sector to logistics, but we were focused on delivering um, you know, healthcare commodities uh, all over India and, and many other countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. But it's essentially a SaaS company, right? So we've we work, work closely with the government of India, the Ministry of Health other folks building this sort of inventory management solutions, warehouse management solutions, but that were off the shelf solutions, not bespoke software, right? So in that time, we did large scale deployments across India. Now, personally, I come from a rural region of another country, right? United States, if some of you might guess my accent, right? So I've always been sort of tuned into um, sort of where rural regions are at a slight disadvantage from urban regions, right? So coming to India, um, obviously family roots here, also with rural roots here in this country, familiar with the agricultural context in this country, familiar with the art artisan context in this country. I knew what a bottleneck uh, logistics was, right? Uh, more than 500,000, um, you know, more than 500,000 distribution businesses in this country don't have access to on-demand logistics. Right, there's a distribution businesses, but they don't have on-demand logistics. This means that they have to they have to use ad hoc solutions. They pay very high prices. They don't have visibility into the goods that they've booked to transport. Um, they don't have insurance or any other value-added services uh, tacked onto it. Just being a distributor in this country is just too difficult. Right, um, unavailability of services, lack of reliability costs that are not transparent and so forth. So we thought that 
the state of technology, the mobile penetration in this country, had already reached a tipping point where this should not be the case. You know, the future of logistics in India is that all 20,000 PIN codes, or at least 17,000 of these PIN codes, should have on-demand logistics. So that's what we're trying to solve for these 500,000 distribution businesses, for 10 million uh, retail businesses, and for perhaps the more than 50 million farm households, that they should that that procuring logistics should be as easy as booking a taxi, right? So that's sort of the uh, the in a nutshell. Now, how did we how have we approached this? We've done something that sounds familiar, like deployed a multi-sided platform, created a market-based solution for crowdsourcing of the five million. Um, unorganized small commercial vehicles in India and matching them to these um, half a million uh, distribution businesses. We've gone very deep in a few market clusters in this country. And uh, we think we've we've achieved a lot of scale since 2019, um, where we've, where I think we'll get into this a little bit later, but our how we've approached scale has been finding six sustainable units of replication, right? rather than sort of just sort of grow, um, just sort of expand without a sense of what your unit of scale is, expand in a way where you discover unit of scale. And for us, that is a regional economy. We look at India as being 70 regional economies, right? So if we can find the solution for one of them, then we found the solution for all 70 of them. And even a single regional com- economy of India, we look at it as between 50 and 80 micro markets. So each and every one of those micro markets needs to be a coherent unit that we have solved for, right? So this is kind of when we talk about scale and how we approach replicability and scale sustainability, uh, that's sort of how we approach it. So again, crowdsourcing logistics, um, automating and reducing the friction of acquiring customers, uh, giving everybody a common platform, uh, which is not necessarily a pure play marketplace, right? Uh, we're a little bit more like a Uber and an Ola than we are than a, just a pure play marketplace where people meet each other and negotiate with each other. We've removed the friction from it. And uh, yeah, so Tusker, uh, we think that sub-regional, we don't do long-haul logistics, sub-regional logistics is going to be, create um, the next, the, the largest logistics companies in sort of logistics, digital logistics 2.0. It won't be coming from long haul trucking. It won't be coming on in, in a lot of other uh, freight forwarding sectors. It will be coming from the most unorganized part of the logistics market, which is downstream of your tier two cities and inclusive of them. Right. So yeah, happy to eventually answer more questions. About that. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, I think uh, these are four really interesting stories, possibly the most interesting stories which most of us have heard today. Uh, very exciting. Uh, so, you know, I'd invite questions from, from people in the audience, but to just kick it off, I have one question uh, to just kick it off. Uh, in a simplistic way, if you throw money at the problem, you can achieve scale, whichever industry we are. But we all know it's not so easy in real life. Uh, we all don't have that kind of funding to start with. And even if we are lucky enough to have, uh, a, let's say, a reasonably large amount of funding, uh, commercial viability is not going to come if you throw money in achieving scale. So I'm sure each of you has had perspectives in your own industry on how do you balance, uh, uh, let's say, achieving scale and at the same time managing cash, cash flow. So how do you manage expenditure and at the same time try and achieve scale? So, I mean, obviously, the perspectives will differ. So, we'd like to hear from one or all of you on that. So, I, I think one of the things is that if you throw money at a problem, it is not always solved. Uh, you know, unless you have a high margin monopolistic business, then yes, you can probably solve it. But those are very, very few, uh, right? And then usually they're very inefficient in the first place uh, to start with. But I think one of the one of the things that we've kind of focused on is in each of our product lines, we've built in and looked at the PNL very closely. So that you are unit economics positive, contribution margin positive, and whatever else is there, which is sort of GNA or tech, you know, that's okay. Uh, so as long as you're doing that, um, then you have an opportunity to be able to scale 
uh, across the board. You don't look at it saying that, um, you know, for example, our LT CAC is like 4x. Uh, and I think one of the reasons we've been able to do that is because we looked at individual product economics and not said things like, okay, this is going to uh, become profitable once I have cross-sell or I have upsell or I have two products sold or two loans given or three insurance products given. Those are all pretty much pipe dreams. They can, cannot happen. That has to be the upside. So I think that's one thing that we've been very clear about. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, we don't do a lot of trade-up BNPL, which is sort of short-term 14-day loans, because they have very, very low margins, and very difficult to actually make it profitable uh, at all, uh, for that matter. So I think that's how you know we've we've kind of looked at the problem from that point of view, and that's helped us obviously reach PMF, and then you start scaling. So we, you know, like last year when we started doing lending, we were like doing two, three crores a month, five crores a month, and that's the time we started making money on it. Then we've scaled uh, significantly over the last one year. So I think that's the way we've looked at it uh, across the board. Thank you. I think he said it very correctly. Uh, throwing money at the problem creates new problems. Uh, so, and I'm a Marwadi. So, disclaimer, we generally don't throw money at anything, uh, especially not at problems. Uh, that being said, again, I, I have to agree. Uh, I think you have to first reach product market fit before you can really plan to scale. Uh, you have to uh, also talk very clearly about what you're not going to do. Once you get clarity on uh, what you're not going to do and why you're not going to do it, and I'll go back to what I said a while back, right? Sometimes you get potentially very exciting, easy to scale models, in our case, service businesses. But when you make a PL and you realize this is not sustainable, you have to sometimes say no to opportunities that are not viable for your business in the long run. Uh, which means sometimes saying, uh, it's okay, I'm happy not to scale my revenues, if that means I'm going to be sustainable in the long run, this is what I do not do, you know, in order to really be true to what you do. That's, I think, my first principle. So I think uh, one thing which uh, Vipul rightly said was that uh, his company was making revenues from the beginning. And I think that's very important because I totally believe that a lot of, uh, like one of the ethos in our company has, from the day one, has been that, uh, um, your customers are your biggest investors actually because they start bringing in the cash flows in the system and uh, actually there is no right solution there is no right problem identification as well what you want to solve it's basically a constant hustle into reaching that pmf and that has to happen uh, with someone's money right and that has to be with uh, um, the customers better than the investors uh, to begin with, I would say. And uh, I think uh, back in the early days when I remember, I think we were trying to sell saris to aunties in uh, Bangalore, which were uh, hardly sourced from different parts of the country. And then tried to evolve our model to finally trying to sell something to a Toyoshima or maybe a Moji Homes or a Zara internationally uh, and then entire supply chain. But I think, uh, um, and I also, I also a Gujarati, so we don't believe into burning capital uh, at all. So, so I think that entity has also been structured in such a way that we can literally uh, sustain for eternity or be a bit of positive whenever we want. Actually, cut down our costs because costs and everything. Once uh, the PMF or you have a visibility of being like achieving a PMF, you keep on investing certain costs to achieve some scalability there but yeah if you're there for a long haul then you can definitely cut down most of your costs any given day and uh, try to increase the sustainability of your venture for long actually yeah. yeah i think i think these are great points i think for our business the only difference was we we looked at the piece our business thesis to begin with was one of um bringing efficiency Right, like using tech to automate procurement of logistics, <laughs> using tech to uh, to aggregate demand. Right, so obviously we had to be very efficient from the beginning because if we are less efficient than the legacy market, then why are we even in business in the first place? Right, so I think for us, we didn't just look at a market opportunity. We also look at from the very beginning, our, our we looked at a very commoditized market. Transportation is very commoditized and it has an equilibrium at a very low service level. So our idea was you have to 
what are we what are we even doing here if we're not going to outperform the market from day one? And part one of the things to outperform the market was we give the same service for a lower cost and a premium service for the same cost, right? So, and that's where we will get pricing power from and, I'll, and we will have a shorter path to network effect basically than other folks because of sort of the operational leverage and other things that we'll get. So we've been, I mean, with us, it's a little bit different because some of some of the other business ideas are actually just blowing open, like bringing a service that just doesn't exist for certain folks. Um, that's a new technology to begin with, right? Uh, so a lot of our tech is kind of behind the curtain. It's new tech, but we don't, the customer doesn't really know about it or whatever. So yeah, that's just my, my two cents. Very interesting perspectives. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, we have <coughs> it's really great to hear the journey. My one question to all of you is how do you went in the quality? Because that's something in the long run, like for him to manage uh, how many 2000 plus <coughs> people uh, who are sending you quality products and it has to be sold across a platform where. The buyer has to believe that it comes with some quality or a quality check. Uh, for her, medical system is the most difficult, I would say, value addition. And no, not the funders, CSR funders actually get into even funding it because the risk, if something goes wrong, uh, the name, the brand goes for a toss. Banking, most critical, I think he's doing a great job because MSME is something like that money even we being a startup, that money, you know, the margin money you need for a month or two is a very big challenge. And trucking, he's looking at something which is like India needs to be delivered. Uh, I think, uh, how do you maintain quality or uh, this critical aspect that uh, the one time user becomes your permanent or he's like, uh, I would say, uh, more advertised for you or he becomes a loyalty customer to you? Begin there. See, for us, sir, I think I'll also tell that uh, we have burnt our fingers enough uh, in terms of trying to understand what the right quality is. And when you work with uh, manufacturers which are not professional, uh, then in that case, all of this becomes a little challenge, right? And being an engineer, not from the sector, like uh, not uh, like not been doing, like only seen my grandfather, not never done in manufacturing myself. So I I think it was a tough journey for us in the initial days. But I think what also happened uh, with time is uh, our own understanding in terms of what quality has to be done. Uh, trying to create innovations in terms of setting up production centers, which can have uh, uh, someone who can do product production and quality mon monitoring there. <coughs> then try to inculcate some lever of technology, which can bring in some efficiencies there. And and we are not a tech company, but tech always is an enabler for us. We're in, Operations sits on the, the forefront and most of these smaller manufacturing areas where we are. And uh, the other thing which I wanted to bring is that we have been able to attract some good talent to join our company. Like we onboarded Fab India's CEO to head us our entire supply. And that was very crucial and important early in our days at any given cost because that was important to deliver good orders and bring scalability for us as well. And uh, the head of design at ITC Wills, she joined us and both of them comes with more than three, four decades of experience. And, uh, and I think that also happened because they also want to break uh, from the monotonous, uh, like the organizations, uh, the large organizations, which are not disrupting enough. And uh, they have been our buyers, both ITC Wills and Five India. So they already knew us in some time. And from them, why they have come in, they brought in more of their people from there. That has literally driven a lot of learnings for us as co-founders, but more importantly, build scale for our entity. While we're, our expertise is just to like trying to create efficiencies through tech now, so that uh, can we scale a million dollars to a ten million dollar run, run rate every single month. So I think that's what we are more focused on. Uh, so thank you, correctly said. We are in medical device. Uh, for me, quality is not as much a choice as it is, you know, what we kind of survive on. Uh, but two two principles, right? One is having extremely stringent, systematic internal checks and balances, right? So quality team in my company has the authority or the ability to stop any order from going out, uh, going out or recall any order that's been shipped 
uh, if they think something you know has gone wrong and no questions asked. So that's one. And second, I think is, and it's probably true for all industries, is customer obsession. Because for customers to become, you know, from your clients to your partners, it, they really just need to see that you're willing to take feedback, you're willing to, you know, go the extra mile, work really hard at ensuring that their problems are solved and, you know, the right quality of service is delivered from them to their customer. Finally, that's the reason they are working with you. Uh, so customer obsession is something that is ingrained in every single person in the organization, primarily the sales team. So sales team is not rewarded only for bringing in revenues, of course, and that's their job. They're also rewarded for, equally rewarded for maintaining, you know, for being good account managers, for the lack of better words. I think those are the two uh, that help us. Yeah, uh, I think finance, it's more about what you stop rather than, you know, what, what comes in, right? So from a lending point of view, uh, accounts, insurance, all of these have a lot of frauds which happen across the board. Um, yeah, you know, there have been large insurance frauds during COVID, uh, totaling to thousands of crores, which we don't get to hear about, would have happened in, in the industry. So I think the essential thing for us is to, one, of course, there's a lot of technology now, which is available. So in our case, we are very tech-led in terms of doing things like verification, fraud control, uh, you know, all of those things. And we want to get better and better at it so that we are not sort of leaving things to chance, but at the same time not being very intrusive. So for example, we don't read SMSs of customers, which a lot of, you know, like credit reads all your SMSs. So <coughs> I don't have credit, so I don't read my SMSs. But, but yes, I mean, uh, you know, we don't read SMSs, but we still make sure that we have whatever information comes in, we're able to verify things like business KYC. Uh, we're able to verify PAN, other of course, is easily verifiable. Uh, and then we do things like, for example, in lending, one of the things we did is we said we don't want to have a branch ecosystem go to every customer. So we do something called a video PD. So we actually do a video personal discussion where from our Gurgaon office, we're able to set up a video call, actually do that call, uh, and then at the same time capture the data of the customers. So we're able to look at the shop, look outside the shop, uh, meet his neighbors. You know all of that stuff so so some of those things are innovative a lot of banks we work with like it and obviously speeds up the process as well and uh, and uh, like you know she was saying you know teams have large autonomy in, in saying no uh, to customers where they think there's a fraud the operating mindset is that if you can minimize fraud minimize um, uh, you know people who want to do fraud uh, right uh, that is usually the small minority. So the more you minimize that, the larger majority, which is usually the good customer who is really intent on increasing his business or feeding his family, increasing his revenues, uh, they get a better chance. So it's 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 in our interest to reduce that. So for us, I would say the quality question, the quality at scale question is in a way a service design, a design issue. So we would say handle more than hundreds of thousands of tasks a month, right? So each order that we process is all happening within a 200 kilometer radius of a tier two city. We're fulfilling these B2B inventory fulfillment kind of movements. Each one of them is 10 tasks, which could have up to four or five different people so it's kind of like a nationwide courier network, but it's all happening on a regional network. So the idea is how do you design a system which has very few failure points, which is so simple that somebody who hasn't even worked in logistics can do best in class logistics just by doing this part that you've broken down to them and then measure everything. Because you can't do monitoring and evaluation if you don't measure everything, which means, again, we don't read their SMSs, but we'll know that, did, we'll know, like the platform will know that if one driver is lingering somewhere for 14 minutes and another one lingers in the same job for nine minutes and, you know, so on and so forth. So that you know how to sort of iterate, you know, better quality over time, incentivize people for better performance and so on and so forth. So you got to measure, if your system isn't measuring everything, then you really cannot automate quality iterations later, right? So yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I want to understand how is the impact angle in what all of you have been doing uh, impacted your investing, like raising an investment journey. So has it pushed you forward? Has it pulled you back? How have you leveraged that or not? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I actually feel that the impact, our, our impact lens helps us with the with this with this fundraising lens as well because at the end of the day impact or not you have to have a problem thesis right so we have a problem thesis that also happens to have an an impact it falls within the ambit of what the impact sector is interested in but if it wasn't you'd still need a problem thesis so i think when you're thinking about solving an actual problem i think a lot of other um Investors who are not impact minded, they don't have an advantage because if they haven't been thinking about a problem, and they're just thinking about an opportunity, which is not necessarily solving a problem, then you can go very deep down a rabbit hole. So I think it's helped us um, in the sense that we've always been thinking about solving a problem. We've always been thinking about the pain point of distributors. We're thinking about the bottleneck of opportunity of drivers and the other people, channel partners that we utilize. Oh, well, to be successful, our channel partners should be earning 50% more than other people, right? Or how can we build better incentives into our model? Because that's sustainability. But if you actually look at it, the way impact people look at things and the way non-impact people, there's actually a symmetry to it, right? I don't think that they're at odds, at, at odds with each other, right? I think the only thing that non-impact people will be like, how much subsidy does this idea need before it takes off, right? Um, but I, I think that they are very helpful. It's a very helpful thing to think of from the get-go. No, I, can, I agree with um, you know the same viewpoint that it's usually the problem statement, how we're solving it. And then it, you have to have obviously a revenue generating capability it doesn't matter if it's impact or non-impact. Um, uh, I think the other aspect is that I think impact or investments through impact uh, can do better, uh, you know, in India. I think there is a lot more that needs to happen. Uh, some of these ideas will have, will take, uh, you know, more bolder bets as well uh, on entrepreneurs. I think which, which, which is, you know, you, you get a lot of people who will sort of follow on or you know, you get a lead and then we come in and so on and so forth, which is kind of weird. So uh, I think there has to be on the on the impact side or even the non-impact side, more VCs or fund managers who are willing to take bets uh, and say, okay, this is a business that I want to invest in. Uh, the discovery process and I think the quality of entrepreneurs has also become much better. So it's not like it wasn't, you know, sometime back I've heard, I've heard stories of people where the VCs put money and the guy just ran away with the money. <laughs> so I think it's much lesser now. Uh, the people who are now forming companies do have better credentials. Uh, so I think some of that stuff is going to make a difference. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I sort of overall feel. I genuinely feel impact investment in India can do a lot better than what, what's happening right now. I think this is a difficult question to answer, honestly, but I'm going to try. Uh, I think for some reason, and maybe I'm wrong, but for some reason, people believe that an impact organization isn't going to deliver them uh, the commercial value in the long run that a non-impact organization would. And uh, I just, and I think that's what this whole panel has been about, right? But I just don't get it because like, you know, both of them said before me, if I'm not creating impact, then what am I even doing? So there is a belief that an impact organization is not looking for as much commercialization, and maybe that's why they're not as bold uh, than you know, your traditional VCs. And I think that's a very inaccurate belief system. And I hope in the next decade, this changes because honestly speaking, it's the organizations that are creating impact that deserve more uh, capital that deserve a little bit more of a risk on them because they can truly impact where this country is heading, you know? Oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I think this confuses me a lot all the time actually because uh, um, um, yeah, whenever I have interacted with an impact investor, he will always begin with asking my revenue.